Today is the second Sunday of Lent. The epistles taken from St. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 4. Brethren, even as you have learned from us how you ought to walk and to please God, as indeed you are walking, we beseech and exhort you in the Lord Jesus to make even greater progress. For you know what precepts I have given to you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from immorality, that every one of you learn how to possess his vessel in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and overreach or cheat his brother in, in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all these things, as we have told you before and have testified. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Holy Gospel, <clears throat> taken from St. Matthew, chapter 17. At that time Jesus <coughs> took Peter, James, and his brother John, and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and was transfigured before them. And his face shone as the sun, and his garments became white as snow. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elias talking together with him. Then Peter addressed Jesus, saying, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us set up three tents, tabernacles, here, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And as he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud said this, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And on hearing it, the disciples fell on their faces and were exceedingly afraid. And Jesus came near and touched them and said to them, Arise and do not be afraid. But lifting up their eyes, they saw no one but only Jesus. And as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus cautioned them, saying, Tell the vision to no one, till the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. By way of announcement, um, for about 20 years I've been trying to put together some form of a <coughs> missal that on one side of the page would have the Mass, the part of the Mass, and then on the, on the corresponding page would be a picture or explanation of the Passion. Because the Mass follows the order of the Sacred Passion of our Lord up to His death on the cross and His resurrection. So, uh, something far surpassing what I was hope, hoping, it's still not in book form, but it is in video form, and I do encourage all of you to see it at least once. And, it's, and you can find it on, as far as I know now, you can find it on 469 Fitter, 469 Fitter, fit as in fitting a shoe on your foot, Fitter, 469 Fitter, um, and see the video on the Meditation on the Mass. Meditation on the Mass. It's a, it's a masterpiece well done by uh, Michael Sistock, who was a seminary many years ago, and has a great talent for computers. But uh, he does something that's a great treasure. And really, every, every soul should see this. And people who, who say, so many people that we meet out in the public, oh, you say the Latin Mass? Oh, I go to the Spanish Mass. I go to the Polish Mass. <laughs> but that's not the point. <laughs> they lose the point. It's not a matter of the language, although the language is important to keep the true doctrine. That's why Latin Mass is so important for the Latin rite, because the Latin doesn't change the meaning. And so the meaning of the Mass is what it's about, which is Christ crucified. The Mass, we go to Calvary. We kneel down before Christ on the cross, and we, we stand and kneel with the Blessed Mother. And this video uh, unites that, the two, which I've always was hoping could be done. 
it is finally done in video form. I encourage you to see it and, and spread it out. Spread it out to many non-Catholics who don't know what the Mass is, is. And how many even traditional Catholics, well certainly Novus Ordo Catholics, just don't know. They think the Mass is a community celebration. It's just a, a, a time of praise and glory and praise and offering the gifts. But that's not the Mass. And all our ancestors understood what the Mass was. That's why they didn't make a fuss about singing Alleluia at the Mass. They were happy to be kneeling down during the whole Mass. And in Europe, how many churches? They didn't have pews. They didn't have pews, nor kneelers. They just knelt on the marble ground. And these churches were packed full. <coughs> and they understood this is the Mass of the <coughs> Sacrifice of Calvary. And it's and that's for 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 so many souls this is so important because we have so distorted God. Modernism has so distorted the true God that so many churchmen, even the Pope, even the bishops, the modernist bishops, they have so distorted God that God is not known anymore. Man has really fabricated a, a graven image of God that's just a man-made creation, a big, huge sugar daddy where, who invites everyone <clears> to heaven and everyone's nice and all religions please him. And whatever way you invent to serve and, and adore him, that's fine. But that's not the true God. God has laid down how he wants to be adored. He has clearly laid down how he wants to be prayed to. And there is only one prayer that really pleases Him. That is the Mass, the sacrifice of Christ, His divine Son, who is God, on the cross. That is the prayer pleasing to God. And that's why the Virgin Mary at Fatima said, Offer your sacrifices to save souls from hell, and offer them with Christ on the cross, which is reenacted on the Mass. So, the Catholic Mass elevates us to who God is and impresses on us who God is. And that's why the Mass begins humbling ourselves before God. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea massima culpa. We all say it. We have all offended God. We are all guilty before Him, having spit on Him and nailed Him and crucified Him and uh, crowned him with thorns and kicked him. All of us who have sinned, we have all, we have all like sheep gone astray. And the Good Shepherd forgives the repentant sinners and he dies on the cross and re recontinues this mystery of his sacrifice on the cross in every Mass. And so, so the Catholic faith, the Catholic Mass, especially of the Roman Rite, impresses on us who God is and what the Mass really is. It is not an invention of some group who sing Alleluia and clap their hands. That is not what God wants to hear. That is not what He's interested in, is, is charismatic Navasoto nonsense, which more insults Him than pleases Him. So the Mass, what makes the Mass of value, and what gives value to all our prayers, and all our sacrifices, and all our life, is to unite everything to Christ crucified. And the Mass is that. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre, so often he used to say, this is why a nun consecrates a girl, a girl who, couldn't be, who could be married, who could have any man he, she wants, like Sister Mary Catherine who of, uh, of the Carmelite Order in the 1950s. She has a book called uh, My Beloved. And she was a high school girl, very pretty, very talented, very gifted. And many, uh, many guys wanted to ask her hand in marriage. And uh, finally, many young priests were telling her, well, you're too pretty, you can't be a nun. You're too pretty. It's, it's not for you. You're too outgoing. And uh, as, if, as if only the ugly and morose and depressing are for the religious life, save the worst for last. 
No, our Lord wants even the best. <clears throat> and so an old priest told her in a convent, uh, in a retreat, excuse me, uh, for their school, which Catholic schools <clears throat> in those days still had retreats, and good old retreats, and he said, no, this old priest told her, no, if you're talented, if God has given you so many gifts, sacrifice all that for Him. Give that all to Him, and that will please Him. Become His bride. And as a girl, she saw, she, they owned a farm, and they, they saw their dad having to butcher the lambs. And she saw all the blood and the bleeding of the lambs, and how the lamb was silent when he was captured. And all the Gospels and all the Old Testament sacrifices came to her mind. And how at Mass the, the, the priest holds up Christ saying, Etche on you stay. Here's the Lamb of God sacrificed on the cross. So she gave her life to our Lord. And she's kind of very similar to the life of St. Teresa of the Child Jesus. A great soul. She lived a ripe old age and died a holy death. You could read her book called My Beloved Sister Mary Catherine Thomas. But the point being, why does a woman, why does a man give their life to God? It's to be united as victims with Christ out of love for the Father and to save souls from hell. That's why. And that's why uh, you other <coughs> folks would remember how many times I've, I've heard, we had a next door neighbor next to us growing up an old, she was never Catholic, I don't know, I don't think she ever converted. Her name was Mabel Finley, pray for her soul, an old lady, but she used to tell us all the time about the clean hospitals run by the nuns. She said the floors were spotless and everything was so clean and ordered and the nuns <coughs> took such loving care of the patients because they saw Christ in the old and the dying. And she said that's that was the best medicine I needed, was just to see this example. And, uh, and she was in and out of the hospital, I guess, often. But she remembered the old hospitals. And if you remember, one uh, convent of nuns told Bishop Sheen, when he asked them, where do you draw your strength? Where do you draw your endurance for this hard work? And the Mother Superior took him to the chapel and pointed to the tabernacle. She said, there, that's where we get our strength, from Christ, Christ crucified. And that's why a priest and a nun, that's why they are chaste, that's why they are virgin, and must strive always to keep the virginity, purity of body, and all the more of the soul, of the mind, of their thoughts, of their heart. Why? Because, not because, the priest is not unmarried because he's too busy and has no time. <laughs> in that case, doctors and some lawyers should never get married because doctors are very, very busy, sometimes more busy than us. That's not the reason, and that's the very modernist idea. But the priest is chaste, and the modern world needs to hear this again, because even Pope Francis, to the shame of, uh, of, of his horrible words, that his own words are condemned by all his predecessors. His behavior is condemned by all his predecessors. And when we get a good pope, he's going to condemn these bad popes and what they said and uncanonize these, these men who have led so many souls to hell. And I'm not saying they're not popes. They are, they are our popes. We believe they are popes. But there can be bad popes. There can be bad presidents. There can be bad bishops. There can be bad priests. There can be bad fathers of families and bad mothers. And bad kids. <laughs> Original sin is real, but it doesn't remove a father from being a father of a family if he's bad. It doesn't but make mom no longer mom if she's bad. It doesn't make a priest no longer a priest if he's bad. Same with the Pope. And you have many theologians who say even if the Pope was a heretic, he does not lose the throne of Peter. He's a bad man. And the church and all the faithful and the bishops and the priests have to stand up and resist him. It is up to Christ to solve that problem. And we're in this problem now. But when this uh, Pope Francis <coughs> uh, 
um, <clears throat> when he said uh, statements questioning and and uh, sometime in the future dealing with priests getting married, he has no right to change that. But why is the priest and the nun and the monk why are they why are they pure and celibate? Why? And Archbishop Lefebvre, he understood the, and taught us the depth of this why. And it is very simple. When the angel appeared to the Virgin Mary, the Virgin Mary was virgin and was prepared to be the mother of God. But God respected her answer. If she said no, the redemption would not have been accomplished. And if she said yes, thank God she did. She knew by saying yes, it meant her own martyrdom, her own crucifixion, her own immaculate heart, which would be pierced through. Because she knew the scriptures well. She knew the prophecies of the mother of sorrows. O you who pass by the way, look and see if there is any sorrow like unto mine. And uh, all the tears that would flow more than what flows through the rivers from her immaculate heart. She knew. So when she said yes, fiat miki, secundum verbum tuum, when she said yes to God, she became at that moment the cathedral in which Christ was ordained a priest. In her womb, Christ was ordained a priest in the hypostatic union. God, the second person of the Trinity, became man in her virginal womb. So her word, yes, her word drew down God from heaven on the altar of her heart and womb. And when a priest says Mass, he says the words of Christ himself. And the moment he says the words, the very moment he finishes pronouncing these sacred words passed down by Christ himself, which no one has the right to change or add to. And so when the new mass changed and put for all instead of for many, that's a doubtful validity. It's very doubtful. And those masses may never be, have been valid. The Holy Eucharist would be valid because this is my body. Most new masses have that, if it's valid and with the proper matter, form, and intention. But the words are doubtful of the chalice. So, when the priest says the correct words, and with the, all the rubrics in the Missal that lay down, it's very clear for the priest when he says the Tridentine Mass, this is a sacrifice. It's so clear. And when he says the words and pronounces them, at that moment, the bread is changed into the, into the very body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ, and the, the wine is changed into the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. And, it, and, it, and because you have the separation of the body and the blood, when a man dies, these things separate. Separation of body and blood shows death. And that action is shown on, in the Mass. The death and sacrifice of Christ by the separation of the body and blood. And so the priest, that's why he is to be chased. Because his words draw down God from heaven to earth. And like a chalice that's consecrated, a priest must be consecrated to God. And a chalice, if you took this chalice and even in goodwill filled it with chocolate milk and drank from it, you desecrate that chalice. It can never be used for Mass again until it's reconsecrated. And so a priest also, like a chalice, he is consecrated, given to God. And that's why the chastity of the priest. That's why the chastity of the nun who, who unites her life with Christ crucified and sacrifices the, the joy of a home and children for God. And the monk as well. And uh, the, the monasteries and the convents used to be always were the backbone of the church. They were the example that no other religion could portray to the world of the truth and holiness of the Catholic Church. 
the holiness demanded for what centers on Christ, Christ crucified. So, um, so back to that video, I do encourage you to uh, see it and spread it around for so many souls who really uh, will profit from it. To see how the Mass is so closely united to Christ crucified. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Uh, that was supposed to be the announcements. and <laughs> So I want to be uh, very short and to the point with this uh, little sermon. And uh, I want to begin with the great quote of Archbishop Lefebvre in 1976. But precisely why are we firmly resolved not to accept this adulterous union of the Church and the Revolution at Vatican II? Why do we oppose Vatican II in the new Mass? Why? Why? Because we affirm the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we proclaim that Christ is God and He is King and He is the eternal High Priest. That is why we are traditional Catholic. That is why we are faithful to Rome of tradition. The Rome of the tradition of the popes, the Rome of, of eternal Rome. And that's why we oppose and continue to oppose until Rome comes back to the Catholic faith. We continue to oppose and not seek any false canonical recognitions and false canonical agreements and false uh, deals with these men who are uh, not only often perverts and Freemasons, but positive destroyers of the Catholic faith. And that's, that's this disease, this infection of, of wanting to make friends and work together with these enemies of Jesus Christ has infected the Society of Pius X and has infected the leadership. But hear those great words of Archbishop Lefebvre. We are not resisting, we're not the Marian Corps SSPX because we're just fighting everybody and all mad and upset. Far from it. We'd be wasting our time and spinning wheels. <coughs> the reason we resist the destruction of the Catholic faith that Bishop Follet is now leading the Society of St. Pius X into and has signed on to, and if he was honest, he would, he would set everything straight and he could, do it, he could do it today by denouncing, condemning, and revoking all the nonsense he's been spouting out for, for the last three years in public. And all this talk of, uh, of uh, accepting Vatican II, 95% of it, and New Mass, is, uh, if the Archbishop saw this traditional Latin Mass, which he told Cardinal Caniceres, if Archbishop Lefebvre saw this, this Novus Ordo Mass in Latin with incense, traditional vestments, uh, in Gregorian chant, he would not have taken the steps that he did. That shows Bishop Lefebvre, Archbishop Bishop Follet has no understanding of why the New Mass is a direct attack on the priesthood of Jesus Christ, a direct attack on the sacrificial nature of the Mass, and a direct attack on the real presence. How come he doesn't know? He knows. And he could solve the problem today. But the fact that he continues to let his ambiguous statements his, his confusing statements and his modernist statements be spread out and, and spread everywhere and everybody thinks, well, that's not what he means. He's nice, but that's not what he means. I'm sorry. If you don't correct, if, if a doctor lets loose a poisonous disease that's affecting the town, he better revoke it. And this disease of the soul is spreading and it's, it's causing immense confusion. And this is why <clears throat> it is not by accident. And the devil works in ambiguity. He works in ambiguity. Um, <coughs> the tactic of the alligators, as the Florida people could tell you. The alligator sweeps his tail. This is how he gets his food. He sweeps his tail on the bottom of the swamp. And he causes this immense 
chaos of confusion of mud and sticks and leaves fall, floating everywhere and the fish are all caught in this and they're confused and the fish when it's dark like this <clears throat> they want to swim to the light but what does the alligator do? He opens his mouth. And inside his mouth, it's all white. It's a white lining. God gave this animal to teach us, beware of the devil's ambiguous ways. And the alligator just sits there on the bottom, opens his mouth, and the fish comes swimming in because they think the whiteness is the top of the water. And he has his supper and his lunch. And that's how he feeds. And this is how Vatican II, this is how the confusion now in the society, this is what's happening. Whip up confusion, ambiguity, what does the bishop really mean? What's he saying? Is Vatican II no longer bad? What do you mean 95% is acceptable? What do, you think, what do you mean the new mass is legitimately promulgated? We've always condemned it as illegitimate. And it is illegitimate. So why is Bishop Fulay talking? This is the tactic of the devil. Does he mean to act wickedly? God knows. I don't know. But his words are acting wickedly, and his actions are. And that's all we can judge, and God alone knows his heart. If his, if his heart is good, then he's being misled by Freemasons in Rome who are leading him. Because he has a great admiration, as you know, for Pope Benedict XVI, who, who is no friend of Catholic tradition. And he is no friend of our Lord Jesus Christ, King. And he is no friend of Archbishop Lefebvre. Archbishop Lefebvre said of Cardinal Ratzinger, he's a dishonest man, and we can no longer deal with him. He's on AM, we on, we're on FM. They want to destroy the kingship of Christ in society. We want to rebuild the kingship of Christ. We cannot work together. And Bishop Fillet, in his most recent letter, <clears throat> praises Pope Benedict XVI. Somehow he caught the bug of Benedict XVI worship. And Benedict XVI is, he, he, he's the engineer, he's the think tank behind Vatican II. He's the think tank behind the dismantling of Catholic tradition. All these once Catholic groups who have fallen to the novice order, it's because of him. It's because of him. And uh, anyway, so we're not just standing on some negative fight. We are standing on something so positive and so victorious and so beautiful that is worth fighting for. And that is Christ is God. Christ is King. Christ is the eternal high priest. That is the Catholic faith. And we proclaim it to the world. And we tell the Judeo-Masons, your kingdom will crumble someday. You're building it high and you think you're going to destroy the kingship of Christ and extinguish him from the face of the earth. And Christ will see, he will, as the scripture says, when he comes and his victory comes to his immaculate heart of his mother, the enemies will bow down to him and they will kneel before him. They will hate to do it, but they will be forced to kneel before him as God, as king, as eternal high priest. So let me just, if I may, <clears throat> Permit me to repeat to you the great hymn to Christ as God. It's written by St. Ephraim. I read it often. You've probably heard it already. I read it almost every year. But it's so powerful. It's so beautiful. And it's a hymn of victory over the devil, over the flesh, over the world, over modernism and Freemasonry. This hymn... Is, is kind of our flag, which we love to hold high, and gets the enemies mad because they hate to hear that Christ is God and King. But we proclaim him as Christ, as, as God and King, and we want him to reign over our country. We want his heart on our national flag. We want his name on our Constitution. We want his name <coughs> venerated in all our schools and law courts and the Supreme Court that Christ's heart be hung up and venerated, and that his laws of justice and charity reign instead of this horrible rights of man, which means, as Bishop Williamson always used to say, liberalism drips with blood. In the name of my rights, 
How many babies have been massacred? In the name of my rights now, how many, how many dead people are being euthanized, euthanized in our hospitals today? In the name of my rights, how many injustices and in trampling on the poor and the oppressed? In the name of my rights, how many souls going to hell? So the rights of man have been condemned already by Pope Pius VII at the French Revolution. And as Leo XIII said, we've heard enough of the rights of man. Let's hear for once about the rights of God, the rights of Christ the King. And that's what we Catholics have to be fighting for. That's what we Catholics must be building for. This is what our schools must be training and homeschooling too, must be training the youth for, to be battlers and soldiers of the church militant, confirmed, marked as soldiers of Jesus Christ to bring about his reign. And too many times, and maybe this is why the Society of Pius X has been punished, maybe so, because our schools are often repeating the same old problem. We give them the, the, the liberal democratic nonsense, and they don't leave our schools fighting and wanting to work for the reign of Christ the King. They're happy with this, uh, this liberal democratic system. <clears throat> But this liberal democratic system, which, which puts Christ on an equal with false religions, as the, as the First Amendment does, we cannot, as Catholics, sit happy with this. We cannot sit at peace with a, a, a government decisions that put God on an equal with false devils. And that's, that's probably why we've been partly punished, because our schools are no longer promoting the youth are not fired up to, the, to, to, to proclaim and build the kingship of Christ because it's too fanatical. Oh, it's too weird. Oh, it doesn't fit in. It's not normal to promote the kingship of Christ. Sorry. And that's why William Thomas Walsh said, the day when Catholics can live at peace with pagans, Protestants, Jews, Muslims, Mormons, and pretend like everything is just a utopian, democratic paradise. Catholics have lost what they're about. And Catholics have always, in, always had the hatred of the enemies of God because they proclaim Christ as God, King, and uh, eternal High Priest. All right. St. Ephraim. Christ led the three apostles to the height of the mountain. <clears throat> Here's his great hymn. The events of our Lord's life in his own divine powers teach those who can learn that he is true God. And his sufferings openly proclaim him true man. And if this does not convince those who are weak and foolish of mind, they shall suffer punishment on the day of his dreadful judgment. For if he were not flesh, for what reason did the Virgin Mary bring him forth? And if he was not God, who then did Gabriel call Lord, when he said to Mary, The Lord is with thee? If Christ was not flesh, who then lay in the manger? And if he was not God, to whom did the angels come chanting Gloria in excelsis Deo, glory to God in the highest? If he was not man, who was wrapped in swaddling clothes? And if he was not God, whom then did the shepherds kneel down and adore before? <clears throat> if Christ was not man, whom did Joseph circumcise? And if he was not God, in whose honor did the new star appear in the heavens that led the Magi? If Christ was not man, whom did the Virgin Mary nurse to feed? And if he was not God, to whom did the Magi offer gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh? If Christ was not man, whom did the old man Simeon take in his arms? And if he was not God, to whom did Simeon say, Dismiss me now, O Lord, in peace.
for I have seen the redemption of Israel. If Christ was not man, whom did Joseph take and flee with him into Egypt? And if he was not God, in whom was the prophecy fulfilled, out of Egypt have I called my son? Hosea chapter 11. If Christ was not man, whom did John the Baptist baptize? And if he was not God, of whom did the Father from heaven say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased? If Christ was not man, who fasted and hungered in the desert for forty days? And if he was not God, to whom did the descending angels come to minister, bringing food and drink? If Christ was not man, who was invited to the wedding feast at Cana of Galilee? And if he was not God, who changed the water into 153 gallons of wine? If Christ was not man, in whose hands were the loaves of bread placed? And if he was not God, who fed and filled from five barley loaves and two fish the crowds in the desert, 5,000 men, not counting the women and children? If he was not a man, who slept in the boat? And if Christ was not God, who was it that rebuked the winds and the sea and calmed the storm instantly? If Christ was not man, who was it who ate with Simon the Pharisee? And if he was not God, who forgave the woman her sins? Only God can forgive sins. If Christ was not a man, who sat by the well, weary from the journey? And if Christ was not God, who gave the Samaritan woman the water of life? And who could, who could see that she already had five husbands? If Christ was not of our flesh, who wore the garments of a man? And if he was not God, who then was it that worked the miracles and signs? If Christ was not a man, who spat upon the earth and made mud from the clay? And if he was not God, who caused the eyes to see because of the clay? If Christ was not man, who wept tears at the tomb of Lazarus? And if he was not God, who by his command alone called forth the four days dead from the tomb? If Christ was not a man, who was it that sat upon a donkey? And if he was not God, before whom did the crowds march and, and give him glory, singing, Hosanna, Filio David? If Christ was not a man, whom did the Jews make a prisoner? And if he was not God, who commanded the earth, who commanded the earth saying, I am he? and threw the soldiers flat to the ground. If Christ was not a man, who was beaten with punches and blows? And if he was not God, who healed the ear which Peter had cut off, and who restored it to its place? And if Christ was not a man, whose face was spit upon? And if he was not God, who breathed the Holy Ghost upon the faces of the apostles, giving them power to forgive sins? If Christ was not a man, who was it who stood before Pilate at the judgment seat? And if he was not God, who caused the wife of Pilate to suffer many things in a dream? If Christ was not a man, upon whose garments did the soldiers cast lots and dice, dividing them among them? And if he was not God, for what reason did the sun grow dark for three hours above the cross? If Christ was not a man, who was it that hung upon a cross? And if he was not God, who shook the earth from its foundations in the earthquake? If Christ was not a man, whose hands and feet were pierced by the nails? And if he were not God, how was the veil in the temple rent in two, and the rocks split asunder, and the graves opened? If Christ was not a man, who died, who cried out as he died, My God, my God, why hast thou abandoned me? And if he were not God, who then has said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do? 
if he was not man who hung with thieves upon a cross? And if Christ was not God, who, who said with the thief, with authority, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise? If Christ was not man, to whom did they offer gall and vinegar to drink? And if he were not God, at whose voice did they shake and tremble? If Christ was not a man, whose side was opened by a lance, and there came out blood and water? And if he was not God, who has broken the gates of hell, and burst the iron bars? And by whose command did the dead that slept in their graves come forth, and walk through the streets of Jerusalem? If Christ was not a man, whom did the apostles see in the upper room at the resurrection? And if he was not God, in what manner did he enter the doors being closed? If Christ was not a man, in whose hand did Thomas feel the wounds of the nails and the lance in his side? And if Christ was not God, to whom did Thomas cry out, saying, My Lord and my God? If Christ was not a man, who ate the roasted fish by the Sea of Tiberiades? And he, if he was not God, at whose command was the net filled with fish? If Christ was not man, whom did the apostles and, and the angels see received into the heavens at the ascension? And if he was not God, to whom were the heavens opened? Whom did the powers adore in fear and trembling? And to whom had the Father said, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy enemies thy footstool? and the rest. And so St. Ephraim concludes, If he were not both God and man, then is our salvation a false thing, and false likewise the voice of the prophets. But the prophets have spoken what is true, and their testimonies are far from falsehood of any kind. And so St. Ephraim uh, concludes this hymn, giving praise and glory to <clears throat> the hypostatic union in our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why, dear faithful, this is why we, we resist. This is why we are the Marian Chorus SPX. This is why we oppose the destruction of the Catholic faith by Vatican II and by compromise with Vatican II. And this is why we must stand strong we must stand firmly on the rock of the Holy Catholic faith, knowing that this trial, this tribulation of the Catholic Church, which we are in, is going to pass. And uh, happy you who can proclaim the truth when everyone else is shouting, crucify him, let him be compromised with Buddha and Muhammad, let him be an equal with uh, Barabbas, let, him, let Christ be extinguished from the face of the earth. Let's not hear of his divinity and his kingship, but let's hear of his Last Supper and his niceness. We won't want to hear that he's exclusively God and he alone is to be adored and he alone is to reign in the political and social order. We don't want to hear that. And we say, yes, that Christ is God, he is king, he is eternal high priest. He must reign in all levels. Once again in Rome, by professing the true Catholic faith of all the popes of tradition. Once again in the political order, by proclaiming him king. And once again in our families and social life. That all of his law, of his law and his true Catholic religion be upheld. And all that is opposed to it be opposed and censored. So let's turn to the Mother of God. <clears throat> She steps on the serpent, because that, that is her role. And on the miraculous medal, you see this very image of Our Lady. But her hands are down, pouring out grace. But she's stepping on the devil, and that is her role. She's going to do it again. <clears throat> so let's pray that her victory comes sooner than later. And let's uh, offer a generous Lent. Sanctify your Lent. Draw close to the passion of Christ. Give time to prayer and thinking of the passion of Christ. And may the Immaculate Heart of Mary strengthen you in this holy Lent 
to be offer your sacrifices, your fastings, your sufferings, your tears, and your joys to the heart of Jesus to hasten the great hour of her victory. O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.